All right, hello everyone. I wanted to start another topic that doesn't relate to any one specific um, time period, but rather covers multiple time periods in history and different areas of history that I teach, whether it's early Western Civ, modern Western Civ, or the history of the Middle East. So this is something more kind of one of these interesting things to think about type of ideas. As you go to college, I always like to make sure students, you know, get exposed to different ideas and not just one idea all the time. And the way to kind of think critically about our world today by looking at history. And it's this topic of the history of censorship. So I've kind of done another one about the concept of erasing history. And they're kind of related, but I think both really important. So what am I talking about here? There is an old famous proverb, right? It says, when you tear out a, tongue, a man's tongue, you are not proving him a liar. You're only telling the world you fear what he has to say. Uh, I don't know whose quote that comes from, honestly. I've seen it attributed to more than one person. Uh, but the idea behind it is very, very powerful. That when you try to silence somebody, you're basically saying, I am scared that whatever they say may may come back to me or may keep them keep me from having influence or whatever it is and we've seen this throughout history where you know people try to censor thought and ideas um, and how this uh, transpires from different civilizations is interesting so i want to give you some some different examples throughout history about this go all the way back to ancient Greece, right? And we have the story of Socrates. Uh, and when you look at Socrates and his story, of course, he comes from ancient Athens, if you're not familiar with that. And during his time period in the fifth century BC, Athens was going through some problems and Socrates was seen as a scapegoat. Uh, and he was, of course, silenced by being put to death, right? He was forced to drink hemlock. So that's an example all the way back from the ancient Greek world when things were kind of falling apart in ancient Athens for a while. Uh, this was after some of their wars, specifically the Peloponnesian War period of time. So that's an example from the ancient world. Another good example from the ancient world is the story of Augustus and a man named Ovid. And a lot of people haven't heard of, of Ovid. Most people have heard of Augustus. So Augustus was, of course, a very famous Roman emperor. And Augustus becomes Roman emperor after a long period of the Roman Republic, where you had senators and councils, and there was this idea of shared governing and shared power, and then uh, things become a mess. Augustus becomes emperor. When Augustus becomes emperor, well, he acts like an emperor in many ways, controlling uh, power, controlling um, who could do what and what could be said. And there's a famous story of a poet named Ovid who was exiled and his works were destroyed by Augustus, by the orders of Augustus. Obviously Augustus isn't doing all this personally, but you get the idea. And the question is why? Well, the theory for a long time is, well, he wrote about things that were um, uh, inappropriate and too sexual and all of that. But the reality is the reason Augustus went after Ovid is because he, you know, he didn't kind of bent to his majesty, so to speak. He didn't kind of take a knee and agree with everything Augustus did. Um, and so because of that, he was exiled. And so we see this throughout much of the Roman Empire history where, you know, if you're a Roman emperor, you know, you're an emperor. Anything you say, you know, it's going to, to obviously have to go what the emperor says or you're going to have a problem. And so we see this in ancient Roman times as well, where you had this kind of censorship by the government and, and essentially the emperor. So that's part of the Roman Empire period. We jump way ahead. You know, we skip the entire span of the Middle Ages. Obviously, there are a lot of examples throughout history, but I want to kind of tie this in with modern times a bit more. In the 19th century, there was this movement called 19th century liberalism. And in this movement, 19th century liberalism, this was a push where there should be less censorship, where people should be more free to have ideas. Remember, this is already after the Enlightenment ideas of Locke and Montesquieu and Rousseau, if you're familiar with them, where, where you know the ideas of absolute monarchy were challenged and the ideas of free speech were becoming more prominent. And so you had this idea of 19th century liberalism that was, let, let's promote these freedoms of ideas. Well, what has happened since the 19th and 20th centuries? Well, if you look around the world, we've often seen censorship take place in extreme regimes around the world. So, for example, 
we have the most well-known stories, right? We have the well-known stories of Hitler and Stalin and China and North Korea. Uh, I mean, obviously, we all know about Hitler and book burnings. Uh, Stalin, I'm going to tell you a really crazy story about him in a second. In China, of course, you know, very strict government censorship on uh, movies and books and information. And in North Korea, well, North Korea is, is you know, one of the most Orwellian states ever created where uh, North Korea is, is just, you know, pure as pure could be uh, censorship and thought control and all of that. And so we see these examples in modern times where obviously big governments and very powerful totalitarian regimes controlled censorship. Let me tell you an interesting story about Stalin. So this is an image, very famous image, I'll explain the background behind it, of Trotsky and Lenin. So who's Trotsky, who's Lenin, what's this got to do with Stalin? So for those of you who aren't familiar, you know, you had the Bolshevik Revolution uh, in the 1917, 18, 19 period where uh, the rulers of Russia fell, the czars fell, and uh, Lenin led this communist movement, and the communists take over, Russia becomes the Soviet Union. Well, after Lenin comes into power, shortly thereafter, he gets ill, he's going to die, and the question is, who replaces Lenin? And there were two people who wanted to replace Lenin, Stalin and this other guy named Trotsky. And so here you see this image of Lenin, Lenin, and here is Trotsky, okay? And this on the right is actually the original image. What you're seeing on the right is the original image of Lenin and Trotsky together. When Stalin comes into power, Stalin decided he didn't want Trotsky to have any more influence. So Trump, Stalin wins this conflict between these two men. But after Stalin won the conflict, that wasn't enough. After Stalin won the conflict, he then took Trotsky and he kind of pushed him out of politics. That was the first thing he did. And Stalin, you're no longer allowed to be in political power in the Soviet Union. Then he silenced him. He wouldn't let him have a voice to spread information. And then he exiled them out of the Soviet Union. He ended up going to Mexico. And then Stalin had him executed. But that still wasn't enough. What else Stalin did, as you can see in this image, he removed Trotsky from history. So he found images and photo, and he just canceled it. Who's Trotsky? Trotsky never existed. Why? Because Trotsky had a different view, a different wanting, to, different, you know, he, he could have seen him as a threat to power to, St to, to Stalin. So he just canceled him from existence. And that's something you see during the time of Stalin. So that's a very famous story from modern Russia history. Again, I could give you examples from other places. Let's take an example from the history of the Middle East, since I teach that course as well. In around 1978-79, there were very dramatic things happening in Iran. Iran is a society that for a long time had good relations with the U.S. They had a Shah in power, a man who was a Shah. He was more pro-Western. He was, you know, gave women rights, voting, uh, you know, modernization, very, very pro-West. However, not everyone in Iran liked him, and there were some very kind of fundamentalist ideas there, and people said, no, the Shah's too West, we don't like him including this one man named the Ayatollah, Ayatollah Khomeini. And so anyways, this Ayatollah guy was a big rival of the Shah. And the Ayatollah had very radical ideas, you know, very, you know, ideas of suppression of women's rights and uh, all, all these very extreme views. And so the Shah decided he was going to silence him. The Shah decided, I'm not going to give the Ayatollah a voice. And that actually backfired on the Shah because people in Iran, they're, 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 yes, they were happy with some of the things the Shah did, but they were also saying, hey, the Shah's being too repressive to other ideas. He's not allowing the Ayatollah to speak. And that actually, ironically, we believe, fueled the support of the Ayatollah. They almost kind of, he almost made the Ayatollah kind of a martyr while he's still alive. The Ayatollah's alive. He kind of almost makes him a martyr. And so with that, the Ayatollah gets more support. The Shah gets cancer. The Ayatollah, you know, is getting big support in Iran. And there's a big revolution in Iran. They get rid of the Shah. The Shah has to flee. And the Ayatollah comes into power. Now, when the Ayatollah comes into power, 
he continues censorship, even more so than the Shah. Um, famous story of the Ayatollah in Iran. There was a man named Salman Rushdie, and this man named Salman Rushdie, he was, uh, you know, he was a man who who wrote this book called the Satanic Verses, uh, and it was a book that about the Islamic faith the, the Ayatollah didn't approve of, and he had uh, felt the wrath of the Ayatollah to the point where the Ayatollah put a a, a bounty on his head uh, for anybody who can find Salman Rushdie and have him executed. Um, and so he engaged in various, very, very high degree of censorship. And that's continued in Iran ever since. What does this lead to? Well, uprisings. Uh, and about those, and we'll say in 2000, I forget the exact year. Uh, but you had the Green Revolution taking place in Iran not too long ago, several years ago. And in that Green Revolution, um, you had people uprising because they're upset about how Iran is controlling speech. And so, you know, you can give examples from Western civilization there. there by the way, the Green Revolution was much more about controlling speech. It was about, you know, a lot of uh, control and, um, you know, lack of, of freedoms in Iran and so forth. Um, it failed the Green Revolution, but it was an attempt to, to, to definitely control things. And so you could see examples from the Middle East. You can see examples from ancient times, from Greeks, for Romans. But I want to tie this in to our modern times, because this is the whole point of this lecture, the rise of the World Wide Web. And would this create more or less control of information? So this is an interesting topic. So as you look at the modern big tech, right, and the World Wide Web and all the things that have come out of it, Twitter, Facebook, Google, um, I put this uh, movie up, The Social Dilemma, very interesting documentary. If you've never seen that, take a look at that. It's, it's, it's pretty powerful as the, the influence these companies have. YouTube would be another one you would put up there, of course. And, you know, do these companies control thought and speech and ideas? Yes, that's that's just obvious, right? The question is, these are not governments, right? These are, are private companies. You know, when people say, oh, they control free speech. Well, you know, the idea of free speech in the First Amendment has to do with the government not controlling your speech. What about these companies? They're private institutions. And the question there is kind of interesting because it, it, there, there is a very strong argument to make that even though they're private institutions, and I'm going to give you a couple reasons, I'm going to kind of show you this in two ways, that they are controlling free speech and violating, you know, the First Amendment, even though they're private companies. How would that work? Well, in the olden days, there was this idea of the public square. And what does that mean? Well, you know, before Internet, before all this stuff, you'd go out to the middle of the public square and you could say what you want to say as long as you're not, you know, trying to hurt anybody, advocating anybody being killed or violent or any of that. You want to go to the public square and say, I believe there are aliens among us, you know, go ahead and do that. Right. Um, today, what is that public square? It's Twitter, it's Facebook, it's Google, it's YouTube, right? Technology changes, right? We've had to adjust our, our understanding of free speech from the time before phones to, you know, uh, the, the times we have today. And so, uh, and so with that, um, you know, you would argue that, you know, these big tech, by controlling the public square, are essentially controlling speech in that say censorship. There's another important concept of this, and this might even be more important. It's the selective censorship these companies are involved with, whether it's Twitter, or Facebook, or Google, or YouTube. We all, I'm sure, are very familiar. January 2021, crazy election. We had the, of course, um, you know, uh, attack on the Capitol building and all of those, you know, horrific things that had, had taken when the, the, the Capitol was attacked. And Twitter then said, all right, well, we believe, Twitter said, we believe that President Trump was responsible for this and we are going to ban him from Twitter forever. And then other people followed suit. So they took what is an opinion and made it into a fact. Can you argue both ways on that? I'm sure people can argue both ways on many things today. That's not my point, right? Uh, if you want to argue he was, one of you wasn't, um, that's not the issue of, of this, of this um, thought process here. What is an issue is the sense, is the, the selective element of it. Because at the same time, I decided I'm going to look some stuff up. 
And I looked at countries like Iran and Turkey, Saudi Arabia and China and looked at a lot of their leaders and their Twitter accounts and uh, their ability to express information on these um, um, platforms was, was accepted at that time. And of course, this may change over the time, but at the time when that happened, everything in those other areas was still able, they were able to still express their views. And so now you get into an important idea of are these companies that have so much power, so much influence, do they have an agenda beyond, oh, we care about, you know, making sure our society is safe, right? Is there hypocrisy to these companies? And if there is a hypocrisy, does that become dangerous? In the sense of what happens, and it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat, Republican, political left, political right, what happens if the people who control information have a symbiotic relationship with one way of political thinking? It doesn't matter what way that political thinking is, right? It, it would be true if it was conservative way of thinking or liberal way of thinking. But if there's a symbiotic relationship there and they are of one mind, right? Even though it's not the government censoring, right? If they think exactly the same and they're doing this, doesn't that end up amounting? And this is a question from, I'm, I'm not saying the answer is yes or no to this. It's a question for you to think about. Doesn't that begin to amount to controlling of free thought and free speech and First Amendment issues? And, you know, I am, I'm curious if any of these ideas eventually make their way up to the Supreme Court and there'll be cases on it and people will kind of really, really think about it in that way. And because, you know, you know, these companies have tremendous influence over our, our lives. And again, watch that, that show, Social Dilemma, it really catches that. And, you know, if it gets to the point, in some ways it already has, we have seen opinions become facts. And that's very dangerous. Are there facts in history? Yes, there are facts in history. But there's a whole heck of a lot of opinions. And, you know, opinions need to be opinions and facts need to be facts, right? You know, uh, and if, if we can't distinguish between that because these companies say, well, no, this is a fact, but it's an opinion, then you're really in danger of knowing what's real and what's true and what's, what's actually in our world. Uh, read 1984 and so by George Orwell. And so these are important ideas, and I wanted to kind of kind of give you an overview of history of censorship because it's not new today. It's very different today with technology, but I think whether it's government or technology, understanding the, the argument of is it a First Amendment, is it not a First Amendment issue, again, that, that's an opinion idea. Is it a First Amendment issue or not? Uh, because it can make a very fair argument that, well, they're private companies. They could do what they want. And then there's the issue of monopolies as well, of course, right? If you know the history of U.S., if you're a monopoly, does that change things as well? So there's a lot to process. But you know, I hope you found this interesting. Maybe it give you a few things to think about. Um, and that's it, right? So I just wanted to kind of have another, another new idea on this. Again, just some, some stuff to think about. All right. Hope you found it interesting. Thank you.